everybody, welcome to Click3D. This is a program where we talk about photogrammetry and how you can use a digital camera to create really compelling 3D models. My name is Eugene Lisho, and I've been using photogrammetry for years now. I think it's a fantastic way to produce just nice visual models if you just want to show people some pretty things, or if you want to take measurements, you can use it as a form of metrology. Now, today I thought I'd try something a little bit different, and that was trying to create a 3D model from 360 video. And it's actually something that I haven't had a lot of success with, but I'm going to go through the process and I just want to show you um, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and kind of the result that I'm getting as well. So let's give it a go and uh, I'll start explaining uh, what I want to do from the beginning. Okay, so to start with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this parking lot that's behind me. And in order to do that, um, I'm obviously going to need some equipment. And the first thing I'll need, of course, is a camera and that sort of thing. So a 360 camera is kind of useful. And one of the reasons is that it's just point and shoot and you kind of get everything that's around you. Now, it takes some getting used to, and the first time that I had a 360 camera, I was kind of like, you know, where do I point this thing or what do I do? And, um, you know, you don't have to do anything really. All you have to do is just kind of stick it up in the air and take some shots. Now, there are some techniques and little tips and things like that that you can do with it, but it's pretty simple to use. And most cameras are not that expensive either. Now, the disadvantage of a 360 camera is that it is not like a digital SLR camera and that means that it has a lot of distortion. And so um, if you're using a true 360 camera, it usually has you know, a couple of lenses, sometimes multiple lenses, but really uh, today you can get them with just like two lenses. Now the problem happens when it stitches the images together. So if you have two lenses, it's capturing images from two sides and it has to stitch those together. And of course, with a really wide field of view, you're going to get some distortion. Now, if you're interested in lens distortion, I just did a, uh, a little episode on lens distortions and kind of what happens with lenses and that sort of thing. So you can always go watch that at the link below. And the other thing is that uh, if you're using a digital SLR camera to create the 360 panel, now you're taking a, a bunch of small little images and you're stitching them together. So it's this stitching process that causes a problem. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, the better cameras will have less distortion, uh, but I found that in, in all cases always going to be a problem. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about the equipment. Okay, so in terms of equipment, uh, you don't really need a lot, okay? So one thing, of course, is your 360 camera, and there are a whole number of options uh, online. You can buy these uh, for pretty cheap. I have the uh, Insta One X, uh, the Insta 360 One X, and it's a really simple camera, uh, compact, small, works with a micro SD card, and it has, you can see, just two lenses. So there's a lens on each side. Um, there are a ton of options here. I'm not going to get into the different cameras. Um, you can spend some time on YouTube or whatever looking at reviews for different cameras. But once you've got yourself a camera, you need some kind of a tripod. You don't want to be walking around with it like this. You want to be able to mount it somewhere and go from there. So there are tripods that you can buy directly for the 360 cameras, but I happen to have a monopod for a digital SLR camera and this particular one actually works the other way that you might think. So it works this way. So you'd put the, the small end down to the ground and there used to be a rubber foot there and then you'd put the digital SLR camera up this way and it helps you with stabilizing and I haven't locked these in otherwise it would be more stable like that. Okay just this way. So since I had this though I said you know what I'm gonna make a little bit of a change so what did I do? Well on the end where there was the rubber foot, I changed this. And the reason is I wanted the large end to be uh, held in my hand and the small end to hold the camera. It's a fairly light camera, so it's not gonna really cause too much instability. So what I did was I took the rubber foot off here and I printed, uh, 3D printed a little insert with a quarter 20 thread. And I basically just glued it in there and it seems fine enough. So I attached the camera on this end here. Now, on this side, this already has a quarter 20 thread for the digital SLR camera, but this was actually going to be the part that I held. And if I've got the camera up here, I thought, well, sometimes it's useful just to put the tripod on the ground and leave it alone. I can run behind a corner, get out of the way, and then take the photos. So in order to do that, I had to make some changes. And I'll show you this up close here. 
So that's the quarter 20 thread. And what I did was I 3D printed this little cylinder that's about the same diameter as the base. And I've got a quarter 20 uh, nut in here that turns this from male. I'll screw this in and then it becomes now a female part. So from here, what I did was I just take a mini tripod and you can find these all over the place. Uh, I happen to have this one lying around. You just open it like that. It also has a quarter 20 thread and I can just screw that in there like so. Okay, like that. So now when I come back here, I can make this nice and tall. Let me put this up like this, okay? So I can put the camera at about eye height, which is actually quite nice for taking photos and then put the camera up here and then kind of let it go. Now it is a little bit, um, I don't want to say a little bit wobbly if it's really windy or whatever, so you have to be careful. But you want to minimize the footprint here because it'll catch this inside the camera view right at the bottom. So you want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, you can, um, when you're doing the photogrammetry project, you can mask this out or whatever. But the smaller it is, the easier it is to get rid of. Okay, and that's pretty much the uh, tripod or what I'm going to use. Now, in my case, I'm not going to be putting this on the ground. I'm just going to be holding this by hand, so I don't need this stuff on the bottom. I just wanted to show you that I had it. Okay, and the only other thing that I'm going to be using here is a phone or the app, the Insta360 app. So what I'll do is I'll have this here, I'll have this in my hand, and this will allow me to trigger the remote uh, just from the phone, you know, without having to hit the button on the camera. So with these three things, I've got my tripod, got my phone, and I got my 360 camera, uh, I'm pretty much set to go. So in terms of equipment, pretty simple, not a lot, very compact, easy to carry around, uh, it, you know, for whatever project that you're going to be working on. Okay, so let's talk about how I'm going to take these photos. So the area that I have is pretty big, it's about 50 meters or so across. And whenever you're taking photogrammetry, some of the same principles apply, whether it's 360 or anything else. And I want to take a number of overlapping photographs. So I also don't want to make really, really big jumps. I want to keep some nice small increments so you, know, you can see all the little details from one image to another. If I was to start on one side of the parking lot and all of a sudden you know, walk 30 meters or so and then take another photo, well, there will be some things that will be overlapped. But there's going to be a lot of details that are simply going to be hidden or occluded. And so those are not going to reconstruct really well. Also, when I'm moving down this way, I'm not just going to take one set of photos. I'll probably take like three or four uh, parallel runs. And this way I'll get closer to some objects on one side and then I'll get closer to the other objects on the other side. And really what I'll be interested in here is just kind of looking at the ground or whatever. Now there are some little uh, wet spots here. There's a pile of snow that's melting here. So the water that's running into the sewer, this uh, part here, the shiny part, is probably going to cause some problems. Uh, and there's also some glass uh, with a building that's behind me. So I'll have to see what happens. But really what I'm interested in are the bricks and the ground, some of the markings on the uh, uh, you know, for the parking spots and that sort of thing. I'm hoping that they're going to reconstruct pretty well. Now, like I said before, I haven't had a lot of success with 360 cameras and photogrammetry, but I'm going to give it a go. I'll run through the process as best I can. And afterwards, we're going to process this in uh, 3DF Zephyr and see what it'll give us. So let's get started. Okay, so I'm at my desk here and on the computer and there's a couple of things that have to happen before I can get started. The first is that I need to be able to get those HDR images into a program and then export it as a, um, a JPEG file. So I did that using the uh, Insta Studio app and so basically just from the phone uh, being able to get the uh, original files, drag them in here, and then I can just go file and then there's a batch export process that I can do when I export them all. So when I do that, it'll export as a JPEG and that is what I will then be able to use. But if you have a quick look, if I just double click on some images, you'll see 
some of the ones that I've taken here. So there's a whole bunch and they look pretty good. It, they're high dynamic range. So you can see it helps to balance out the colors up on the sky and on the ground. So not too bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on to 3DF Zephyr and I'm going to start a new project. So I'm just going to go new project. I'm going to go next. And then what I need to do is I need to import from panorama picture. Okay. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to hit plus and then I'm just going to need to go to my file here. So just give me a second and I'll get there. Okay. So I just went to the folder where I have all of the images and I'm going to select them all and just hit open. Now what I have here is, or what uh, 3D of Zephyr is going to do is uh, decompose the images. So what it does is it takes the spherical image or this, or it takes this rectangular image. And then what it's going to do is, is break it up into cubed sides. So basically uh, six sides of a cube. So I can choose at the bottom here if I just want the left, right, front, back, up and down. Now, if I don't want the bottom because I was standing there or whatever, you know, it's going to see me, I can do that. You can also mask all the images. Let me try it with just for the heck of it. And then it says, where am I going to put all these images? So I'm going to make a folder here and I'm going to call it decomposed. And it's going to stick all of the images in there so it just needs a second to uh, process all of these okay so that's done and i have all these decomposed images now and i'm going to hit next and it recognizes that they're all from panoramic images so i'll say yeah just uh, they're all linked to a uh, images it will relink them and i'm going to go yeah this is going to be a close range project now i could go deep um just for the heck of it i'm going to stick with the default and then click next and then run so we're going to give this a second to uh, extract all the key points from all the images and then we'll come back and we'll have a look at uh, what it looks like so it's just completed and if i scroll down the list this yes here means that it's been reconstructed okay so let's just scroll down and it looks like every single image was able to be matched with key points. Hey, that's, well, that's pretty good news. So that's a good start. And the fact that I took a lot of overlapping images, I think has helped a lot. Now, if I look at what I've got here, it's not all that great. You can see I have all these uh, cubed images here. These are like the different camera positions and uh, that's sort of what it breaks it down to. And I can see that I've got a sparse point cloud here. A lot of noise, not really crisp or clean, but hey, let's continue on with this and let's see what happens. I'm actually just going to isolate the area that I want it to work on because I don't really want it to work on um, just a really, really big area. So I'm just going to narrow this down and you, I can do that with this little box here. And basically this bounding box will help me reduce the size of what I need. So let me get that back in there and there and then I'll just adjust it while I'm here okay like that and all right we're getting there we're getting there like that great okay I'm just going to narrow this way down because there's a lot of noise on the outside I don't need that even uh, these are the buildings that are across I don't want that I just want it up to the uh, little barrier wall that's there that would be good enough and even on this side that's a lot as it is so um, I don't need to go that high. I just want to go as high as the building. Uh, so right about there, that should do it. I think, yeah, that's okay. I'm just going to push this a little bit more and that's okay. So that's my bounding box. So it's only going to work on the area that was inside the bounding box. And the next step is going to be to go with a dense point cloud. So I'm going to choose all the cameras and make sure that it ranges, uh, that they match. And I'm going to choose close range and I will use default sure let's do that um i was going to say fast but um i'll see how many points it gets when we run a standard project so we'll let this cook for a little bit and in a minute or two i'll come back and then see what we got okay so that took about five minutes or so and it says that it completed the uh the dense point cloud and this will give you an idea of what's going on um what i'll do is i'll hide these uh camera positions here there's no sense having that and you can get a sense of what the point cloud looks like now you can see I've got a lot of noise up here 
right, which is a real pain. So what that means is I either have to clean that up somehow and get rid of it, um, or maybe try some different settings that are a little bit more aggressive, something like that. But um, not all that great from a uh, dense point cloud perspective. Maybe what I'll do is I'll take the bounding box and I'm going to take the top and just drop it down a bit more just to see what I can get. Um, well, just about here. It's actually picking up, um, it looks like to me, some of the sky and that sort of thing and thinking that there is actually some geometry there. So let's uh, make this a little bit smaller here. I'll make it a little bit tighter on this side like that. And let's see what happens when we try to get a mesh out of this. I can't expect anything decent um, at this point just based on what we've got. But hey, let's give it a go and uh, you never know maybe we'll get something half decent uh, remember this is 360 video and i know that it's never easy uh, doing it this way so i'm going to choose close range and default and go ahead and run and let's wait a couple minutes we'll be right back and we're back and it did finish the triangular mesh let's have a look to see what this looks like so you can see right off the bat this is not great uh, not exactly what I was looking for. Uh, the building that's actually further back here, uh, it sort of got tricked into thinking that it was right on the where this little retaining wall is. Well, that's not true. Uh, that's not where it is in actuality. The parking lot itself is really rough. So, I mean, the lines and everything else, um, you know, this... Uh, water down the middle wherever it puddles I can see you know where there's a little bit of shine or whatever that can cause a problem uh, you can see the little uh, tractor over here also really gummy sort of uh, just not looking all that great but I was really interested in just the you know parking lot spaces or whatever and maybe if you wanted something really really rough it would be okay but I'm not all that impressed with what 360 video can do so it really doesn't make sense for me to move on from here. I could, you know, try retexturing and, you know, putting that on here. But ultimately, the mesh is going to always be sort of ugly, uh, if you want to call it that. But I was able to produce something from a 360 camera and 360 photographs. So maybe not what you're thinking. Maybe if you want to try yourself, give it a go. You really need to find the right environment. Um, it takes a little work. I could go back and try to tweak a bit more. You can see the retaining wall is not too bad here. Uh, the building structure, uh, it's a little, uh, uh, just not nice. Is not what I'm used to. Um, I think if you were to use a digital SLR camera, you're going to be far better off, like I said, especially for the bottom here. It will mean a bit more work in taking the photographs, different angles, but you're not going to get all of this uh, nonsense that's over here. So that does it for Click 3D, and we had a really difficult time trying to get a good 3D model from 360 photos. It would have been even worse if we had used video. So please keep in mind that if you are looking to try something like this, experiment with it first. Now I've used uh, 3DF Zephyr in my work, and it could be that there's other programs that do a better job, but I've really found that most programs are going to have a difficult time using spherical images just because of all the distortion and some of the stitching issues. So that does it for this episode of Click3D. Thank you for watching, and we shall see you next time. Bye-bye.